<laughs> I know. It was something that made us not Yes. Move. All right. And then we can make this work. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is not only board certified in internal medicine, but also lifestyle medicine. Her name is Dr. Judy Brangman, and please welcome her to the show. It's so nice to meet you. Hi, everyone. Hi, Chef AJ. It's so nice to meet you, and I'm so excited to chat with you today. Yeah, I know we were supposed to meet earlier. You were on the show a few months ago, and then you had some car trouble, and we had to reschedule. So you're definitely worth the wait. And I want to tell people how I first heard of you was a summit. You hosted a wonderful summit called the Reclaim Your Health Summit. I had not heard of you at that point. And I also host summits. I host two summits a year, one on GI health and one on weight loss. And I thought you did a fabulous job. I loved the way you interviewed people. You let them talk, you, you know, and, and the guests you had were all people that I have since pretty much all of them have either been booked or are booked on my show. You got such wonderful, wonderful speakers. Thank you. And I love that. That was one of my objectives with the summit. I wanted to showcase people that you don't see typically in the other summits that you see. And I wanted to do something that was geared towards uh, people of color, minorities, because of the disproportionate way that uh, we were affected by COVID and those statistics that came out. And so it was really great. I've seen several of the speakers from the summit who before, you know, most people had not really heard of and they've gotten several speaking engagements since then. So that really makes me happy. They're, they're really great. I mean, like I, like I said, as many of them as I could find, I've booked on the show and, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of them have introduced me to more people that weren't on your summit. And that's what I love. I love people that I, I don't want to just have the usual suspects because there's so many people doing great things all over the world. We need to let people know about them. Yeah, that's what I'm finding out. You know, sometimes we see a lot of the same people in the plant-based world, the big names, but there are people that are doing amazing things on the side that you may not even know of, kind of just working, you know, in silence, but they're doing some really good things. So, yes, definitely yeah. excited to, you know, showcase other people and also bring to the forefront plant-based nutrition to a community that I feel sometimes um, may not be as open to it as others. Yeah. So how did you become someone in the plant-based movement? Tell us your story. So I first learned about plant-based nutrition, maybe it was in maybe 10 years ago, I think. I had a friend who was vegan. And it's so funny because initially I used to think that vegan diets were deficient in nutrients and unhealthy and just not something that was desirable. So I used to actually challenge her like about what she was eating. And then later on, I seemed to develop um, acne. In my 30s, I developed acne. And then also, I think I developed lactose intolerance too. So my mom was like, you should cut out dairy, you know, because dairy is not good. You know, my, my mom is a health guru, pretty much. And she was like, stop eating dairy, because I was eating cheese every day, ice cream, love dairy, everything, macaroni and cheese, cheese, it's everything with cheese. I loved it. And I probably ate it every day. And so that was how I first started cutting back on animal products and eliminating dairy. And I didn't do it suddenly like some people do. I did it over probably a year or more, just gradually cutting it back. And then I did periods where I did not use dairy at all for maybe a week. And then I felt great, you know, my acne cleared up. And then, you know, I go to an event and then I would eat something again. So I kind of went like that for a while. And then I started to read more, do the research, started to go to conferences like American College of Lifestyle Medicine, started to get involved and became a member of PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and learned about the health benefits of going plant-based from every disease state, and also learned about the ethical aspect of animal farming, agriculture, the environment, and that aspect. So that kind of motivated me more. And then when I started to talk to my colleagues and my patients about it, it became clear that nutrition was not anything that uh, traditional medicine is emphasizing. Plant-based nutrition is not really um, uh, mainstream in traditional medicine. So my goal and objective became to be a voice to kind of merge the two together, the traditional allopathic medicine with more of a holistic um, naturopathic viewpoint because 
I think that's needed. There are a lot of people that are promoting plant-based nutrition, but I think patients do need to hear it from the doctor, especially, you know, you have a primary doctor, patients put a lot of trust and respect in the individual. So it's better if they are on board with nutrition to some degree, as opposed to the general idea that I think exists where we think that nutrition is not important. How long ago was that? Um, so that was 10 years ago when I started transitioning, um, but I would say I went fully plant-based probably now six, seven years ago. Right. So what have you seen different in your patients since you started using lifestyle medicine? Yeah, so when I did primary care, I would always talk to my patients about nutrition. And it was so funny because it would take them by surprise because they would say they never had a physician talk to them about diet. So some of them were actually turned off by it. Some of them didn't like it. They just went to come in and get a pill and leave. But the other ones where I just, you know, gently say something like, you know, your blood pressure could potentially be better if you change your diet. And they say, how? And then, you know, I just introduce something small like, well, how many vegetables do you eat in a day and sort of encourage them to eat more vegetables because what i found was that most of my patients um did not even eat two servings of vegetables in a day which is unbelievable to me because you know i try and get like five six seven fruits and vegetables in a day so if you have a meal without any produce to me i'm like what is that <laughs> so yeah i just try to start with small simple changes and so you know Patients actually really do want to eat healthier, I think. So I know I had one patient in particular, she had had diabetes for years. She was in her 60s. And um, she was a smoker as well. And I started to talk to her about nutrition and encourage her to eat more vegetables because she was eating a lot of fried foods. She was eating pork, bacon regularly and different things like that. And so I just was encouraging her and then, um, I was actually surprised at how quickly she made the change. In her three month follow up, she went from eating one vegetable a day to eating like three or four in a day and was cutting out the pork that she was eating. And her diabetes really improved more than I thought it would. I was actually surprised. Her her number went from, I think it was like nine, which is an uncontrolled or, or high to like seven, like 7.3. Um, so we was able to, we were able to decrease the doses of one of her medications, which was good. And that really was um, satisfying because the way I see it is that people spend money on medications. Um, and if you can save that money, you could potentially be doing other things with it, you know, other things to advance other causes to help other people around the world. And um, so, yeah, that's why I'm so passionate about this message of, you know, plant-based nutrition, and then also lifestyle medicine. Yeah. When did you decide to get board certified in lifestyle medicine? It's the newest discipline in medicine, isn't it? Yes, it is. So they started the board certification in 2017, and I was in that group. I was in the first group to become certified. And each year they have more and more physicians that are certifying. You don't have to be a physician to be certified. It's open for, um, I think, nurses, physical therapists, anyone in the healthcare field, I believe. And um, so, yeah, so that's exciting. I go to their conferences every year, American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, and the latest thing that I'm looking into, I did a conference on uh, obesity medicine. Um, so learning about that. So that's exciting. Wait, you, you, you produced a conference on it? No, I um, signed up for some CME about obesity medicine because I'm planning to do the certification for it. Wow. Oh, it's learning. <laughs> Wow. Well, if you get that done before the end of the year, maybe you can be an expert on the weight loss summit because that sounds amazing. Yes, I'm hoping to have it done this year. But yes, I did see that you did a summit this year and last year. That's amazing. I've been following you for a long time. Wow. And I know you have a story too. Yeah. That is fantastic. You look, you don't almost look old enough to be a doctor. You look. I know. It's (laughs) so funny because people say that all the time. And medicine actually was my second profession. I worked for a medical, I worked in a hospital as a medical technologist for about four years before deciding to go to medical school. So if someone wants to do the math, and I've been in practice for eight years now, wow. out of residency for eight years. Uh, JL say, where are you from? Oh, yes, I am from Bermuda. 
I grew up in Bermuda and I visit quite frequently. <laughs> so yes, that's where my accent is from. Nice. You know, you, you mentioned the patient that you had ate maybe two servings of vegetables a day. That almost seems high for America because there's people that don't eat any. I know. And it's so unbelievable to me because, and what I tell people is we need to retrain the way we view our food and our plates. I think most of the time in America, we think of the plate as being incomplete if it doesn't have meat on it or, you know, half of the plate being protein. But I think of it differently. I think of a meal as, I think of a meal as incomplete if it doesn't have enough vegetables. So every time that I eat at least half of the food, I try and make it vegetables mostly vegetables and fruit. And my mom, who's like my real inspiration, she is amazing with that. She eats two cups of vegetables every meal. And so um, whenever I visit her, I end up eating a lot of greens, broccoli, and um, she has a garden. So we eat like fresh produce. Were you raised either vegan or vegetarian? No, we were not raised um, vegan or vegetarian per se, but we, um, attend a Seventh-day Adventist um, Christian denomination that tends to emphasize or encourage vegetarianism. So we were sort of plant heavy, I would say, where we ate chicken, turkey, and fish on occasion, but it wasn't every day, um, but we did eat dairy. And, um, but, you know, over the past 10 years, my whole family has just gotten more healthy as far as really reducing or eliminating processed foods, and fried foods and sugary, sugary foods as well. So yeah, my mom, my mom and my dad actually, um, I think are my inspiration really because like they're so different than the patients that I see. I'm internal medicine, so I work in a hospital in Raleigh, North Carolina, and so I see patients, um, typically ages forty to forty and up, um, but generally speaking. I find it unusual to have someone that's almost 70 that takes one medication or that's never been hospitalized or has never had surgery. It's really unusual. Um, but that's my parents' journey and seeing the way that they lived, it inspires me that, you know, I don't have to become debilitated when I um, get older and reach 50. A lot of times I think people expect to get sick. They think that it's a normal process that happens just by getting old people say oh i'm getting old you know but a large portion of how we live influences the chronic diseases that we will develop later on in life so we're starting i believe it's tomorrow lifestyle medicine week so for people that are unfamiliar with that term what what is lifestyle medicine yeah so tomorrow lifestyle medicine week and it uh, I actually have a slide, which if I, can I show the um, graphic that they have for the six pillars of lifestyle medicine? You bet you can. Let me just, uh, let me do this, make sure that I can put the little button that says, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I can show everyone the um, graphic. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's put it in presentation mode if I can. There we go. Okay. So lifestyle medicine involves six pillars, as you can see here, healthy eating, which emphasizes a whole food plant-based diet. Um, second pillar is physical activity. The third one is managing stress. Then we have forming and maintaining healthy relationships, getting adequate sleep and avoiding risky substances. And the definition that the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has adopted is this one here. Uh, lifestyle medicine is an evidence-based approach to preventing, treating, and even reversing diseases by replacing unhealthy behaviors with positive ones, such as eating healthfully, being physically active, managing stress, avoiding risky substance abuse, getting adequate sleep, and having a strong support system. And so when we, when I did the uh, lifestyle medicine certification, there was a course that I did, and it went through each of these in detail. And it was very helpful. It was not things that I had learned in my training before. So for example, sleep, that's a issue for a lot of people, especially in primary care. So with that information, the specific things that people can do to help them sleep better, whether they have problems getting sleep, 
staying asleep or whether they wake up too early. And then also with physical activity, um, the guidelines recommend at least 150 minutes a week of physical activity. So the main difference I would say with a lifestyle medicine physician and someone who probably doesn't have that background is that when I see a patient with high blood sugar, for example, maybe they're not diagnosed with diabetes yet, maybe they're pre-diabetes, I would discuss these areas with them instead of just giving them a prescription. Um, if someone has high blood pressure, instead of just giving them a prescription for blood pressure medication, I'm going to discuss one or maybe more of these specific areas, but always um, I'm touching on nutrition. So, and this, so this week I'm going to be sharing posts about lifestyle medicine and they have several social media graphics as well. Um, they have a challenge, which I think is pretty cool for each day. Challenge yourself to complete these daily wellness challenges. And the first, yeah. So go ahead. No, I'm good. I was going to say, well, what day? Would we start tomorrow? Yeah. So Monday, eat more plants, try going meatless, and for three to four servings of vegetables. Uh, and I tell patients and clients that you're going to get the most bang for your buck by improving your diet. Sometimes people work out super hard and they may eat unhealthy, right? So they may think, okay, I ate unhealthy today. Let me work out in the gym. But you will get, if you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to improve your blood sugar or your blood pressure, you will get more bang for your buck, so to speak, by making sure that your diet is healthy, that your diet is on point. And it's not just a matter of eliminating animal products, but it's the processed foods also that is a problem. I think even more so the added sugars. If you look, there's like added sugar and just about everything, even ketchup. And it's not even necessary to be in ketchup. You know, even savory foods have um, sugar and sweetness in it. So I try and focus on eating more plants, cutting out the sugars, uh, eating the rainbow. I'm sure most of you have heard that. And, you know, making sure that half of the food on your plate is fruits and vegetables and mostly vegetables, actually, because that's going to have your antioxidants, um, your vitamins, your fiber, greens, um, broccoli are really good for calcium and kale. And then water, of course, water is important, too. So um, they say drinking like half of your body weight in pounds in water is how much ounces you need to drink in a day. But a easy, simple way to know whether you're hydrated or not is, and it maybe sounds weird, but it's your urine, whether it's dark or whether it's light. So that's basically, basically that. So yeah, um, so the next um, pillar that we focus on in lifestyle medicine is relationships. Um, they've called this love more. So with the social, social media, um, with the pandemic and a lot of people working from home, you know, we had to be creative with our way that we keep in contact to, with people, whether it be Zoom calls, connecting with friends and loved ones that way. Uh, relationships are important. Unhealthy relationships do affect our stress level, they affect our mental health, as well as our emotional health. So um, as people, you know, we are designed for uh, social contact and uh, connection. Okay, and the third pillar of lifestyle medicine is getting adequate sleep. And I know oftentimes people think, oh, I don't need to get seven hours of sleep. I am fine on four or five hours. Um, but the data really shows that seven to eight hours of sleep is ideal each night, and that's being restful sleep. Um, one of the things that I find several people or in practice that I used to find that people that had problems sleeping did was um, having a TV in the bedroom, um, using the phone in the evening and drinking water close to bedtime. Like within two hours of bedtime, if you're drinking anything, chances are you're going to probably either have to get up during the night to use the bathroom or it's going to be harder for you to get to sleep. Um, some other tips to go to sleep better, to sleep well, would be starting to unwind one hour or two before bed, you know, turning off devices, the phone, uh, reading a book, or doing some meditation apps. There's an app actually that I like, uh, Calm, C-A-L-M, 
and abide is another one that plays very restful relaxing music and it kind of helps you to unwind also another tip to help your audience or individuals sleep better will be exercise and i find this myself i don't know if you find this but i find that if i work out that day or go for a run or even just a walk it doesn't even have to be high intensity um in the afternoon when i come home after i shower later on that night i found that i just sleep so much better um so exercise really does help with sleep and i could talk more about sleep too because i feel like it's it's um, sort of minimized as far as its importance, but it's also important as far as weight loss too. Um, your hunger hormones, leptin and ghrelin are regulated by our sleep. So when you don't get enough sleep, it makes it harder for you to lose weight. All right, so I'm just pausing. There are a few more, but I didn't know if you had any question or anything. Oh, I was gonna let you finish and then okay. the questions okay. are in the chat. Okay, cool, we can do that. All right, so the next one is physical activity. Keep moving. The more you move your body, the better. Um, sitting down for long periods during the day, like an hour or more, you can just find simple ways to get up and move, whether it be just getting up and stretching, having a stand-up desk. Um, this has aimed for at least 30 minutes of activity today. So that's the challenge for um, that particular day for this week. But a simple rule to think of is find an activity that you like to do because it should be enjoyable, right? So maybe you like to go walking or you like dancing. Uh, you can pull up a video on YouTube and just exercise video and work out like that and exercise that way. But the more that we the more the more that we move our bodies, the better. Getting physical activity. As far as the additional benefits for physical activity. It has to be sustained and it has to get your heart rate up to a certain level. So really at least 15 to 30 minutes at a time is how much you want to be moving. So even though it's good to say, okay, I have a job where I'm on my feet or I, you know, take the stairs at work, that's good too. But even better is, you know, dedicated exercise periods where you're walking or running or whatnot for 30 minutes at a time. Uh, and staying calm. So um, things like mindfulness, uh, relaxing, listening to music is important as well. And we learned about this in lifestyle medicine, the benefits of uh, mindfulness based stress reduction, uh, yoga and exercise. And there are a significant portion of people that present to primary care, for example, with symptoms, physical symptoms, for example, abdominal pain, but it's stress related. It's something that's going on, you know, in their personal life that maybe they haven't acknowledged or addressed yet. And it's somehow manifesting in physical symptoms. And I know that I found that more often than I, that I wanted to in primary care where someone was coming in for a physical symptom. And then just as I spent more time talking with them and kind of delved a little bit deeper, it was clear that there was something else going on as well. Um, so just basic premise of that is that stress does affect our health. Um, and so the next challenge um, for this week would be avoiding risky substances. So being present is how they, they are wording this, but avoiding risky substances such as tobacco, drugs, um, smoking and alcohol as well. Um, they used to say that the upper limit for alcohol for women was, I think it was like three drinks a week. Um, and then for men, like four. But lately I've seen data and um, data coming out saying that no amount of alcohol is healthy. And I think that's the premise that most lifestyle medicine doctors take, or at least I do, um, that there's really no need to consume alcohol. So it's probably best to not. Um, and so, yeah, so that was it. I wanted to go back to the original slide of lifestyle medicine. Yeah, so we talked about all six of these um, lifestyle medicine pillars is kind of how I like to think of it. And I think of it as like holistic health. You know, I think really 
medical school should include this in the training. It should not have to be a separate thing. So that would be my dream if one day this was a part of the curriculum for all medical students and in residency where we were actually learning about nutrition. Um, but I'm so grateful for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine who has been um, a pioneer basically in you know establishing this as a specialty and as a subspecialty. All right, so I will stop here and see what questions do we have in the chat? Absolutely, that was great. Most doctors don't talk to you about the pillars of health. They talk to you about the pills. <laughs> I know, right? Yes, that's so true. So here we have, I do see some questions here. Uh, well, Tiffany says, I applaud physicians that are having these plant-based discussions. And she says, I've heard that going through medical school, students only get a few hours of nutritional study. How much time is actually devoted to this during the process? Yes, that's actually correct. I know lately that's been trending on social media that about 20% of medical students get any nutrition training. And those that do, it's very little. There are some schools that are doing better about that, like Loma Linda, Medical University of South Carolina, I believe, and there are a few others. But honestly, I really don't remember getting any nutrition training. I do remember with diabetics, we were told to tell them to do a diabetic diet, but I was never told what a diabetic diet is. I used to just think they're not supposed to eat carbs or they're not supposed to eat junk food. And I know that we learned about the uh, DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet very briefly, but I had never heard plant-based diet mentioned at all in medical school. Actually, I was like, <laughs> it's so funny when someone first mentioned it to me and I actually saw that there was like evidence behind it. I was really surprised because initially I thought it was just some something that you know people were doing but it wasn't you know scientific because they drill into our heads that everything we do should be evidence-based there should be research behind it there should be data <laughs> and so initially i used to be like well, where's the data where's the evidence for plant-based nutrition and then i just went on pubmed and did a search and was amazed to see that there are a lot of articles about plant-based nutrition so i started to save them i have so many articles saved in my computer about plant-based nutrition. So um, yeah, it's been a journey for me to come from someone who was resistant to plant-based nutrition, so to speak, who's now uh, supports it. So I can see how some people would be um, against it. And I, I especially can see how some physicians would be because it's just something that's foreign to them. You would think, though, that they might be more interested in it. You would think so. I mean, for me, I actually love getting patients off medications. Like, it really probably sounds atypical for a physician because most of what we learn in our toolbox, to be honest, is prescribing medicines. Like, we learn about the pharmacology, the side effects of medications. I mean, a, huge, a large part of our training is pharmacology, mechanisms, pathophysiology, um, yeah, that's a large portion of it. But, you know, to me, I feel like I can actually really make an impact in my patient's life if I actually give them a tool to help them to be well instead of a tool to kind of just maintain. And um, it's funny because when I was choosing a specialty, so you do four years of medical school and then you pick a residency. And I chose internal medicine. I'm so glad that I did. But I remember my colleagues who chose other specialties saying that they didn't want to do internal medicine because they felt that you don't ever cure anything or you don't ever fix anything. You know, people get diabetes and they, they never, um, I, I, don't, I don't want to use the word cured, but they're never able to come off medications is basically what they said. Basically, you know, you have a high person gets high blood pressure and they never ever get better. It just is progressive and they eventually need more and more medication. And that's basically how that goes. And I, I didn't know. I didn't know that it was possible for blood pressure to be improved with diet. And it doesn't take long. That's the thing. Like I've had people who um, didn't go fully plant-based, but just getting those vegetables in and that more that potassium, I think that potassium helps to lower your blood pressure. Um, starting to move and become more active, they're able to drop their blood pressure, the top number, the systolic number, systolic blood pressure by like 10 or sometimes even 15, 20 points 
um, in a short period of time. It must feel very rewarding to be able to do that for your patients. Yes, it does. I've only had one patient though that went fully plant-based, but he was already interested in being plant-based when he came to see me. And he came to see me because I was plant-based. But um, unfortunately in that initial visit, after doing lab work and whatnot, determined or discovered that he actually had diabetes. Like I did blood work and diagnosed him with diabetes that was really um, uncontrolled. Um, but fortunately for him, since he was already motivated to go plant-based and had actually really, I think just that week or that month had kind of started to kind of switch over. But basically short end of the story is that, you know, I obviously had to prescribe him insulin and um, oral medication for diabetes. But within three months, he was able to eventually, in three months, he was able to be off of those medications. Um, so it, it didn't take long. I was really surprised. And although I'm not doing primary care anymore, I'm in a hospital setting, I do keep in touch with him and um, he's still in remission. Um, I, I prefer the word remission instead of cure, um, but he's in remission for diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Um, and so, yeah, so that was that was uh, very exciting. What is a hospitalist? I mean, I know, but I'm thinking that there are people that may not be familiar oh, yeah. with it. I don't think they had them when I was little. Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked. So an internal medicine physician like myself can either practice in the clinic. So we call that primary care. Or you would practice in a hospital setting. Uh, and the term for that is hospitalist. Um, there are few, there are some physicians in some parts of the country that still do the traditional model that you're probably um, referring to, where you would see the patient in clinic, and then if they had got sick and needed to be hospitalized, then you would also see them there. But now it's more separated out, so people are usually either hospital-based or outpatient clinic-based. So then, you know, because I remember, I mean, I think I haven't been in the hospital except for that one time I, I got... Uh, like a food poisoning on my honeymoon. Mm, and, oh no. Uh, that was uh, that, that was what almost 30 years ago. But I remember like, you know, you have a primary doctor and then he puts you in the hospital, you know? So now mm -hmm. what you're saying is when you go to the hospital, you're meeting somebody brand new that's going to take care of you. Yes, exactly. And some some of the older doctors don't like it. Um there it does have its downsides, you know, the continuity of care and that history of knowing that patient, you know, you're really trying to really get to know that patient quickly. Um, so it's a, it's a, a profession, um, hospitalist is where you have to think quickly, think on your feet and, um, you know, digest the information about the patient and learn what's going on quickly. But because I've done both, I've done primary care and I've done hospitalist, I'm really conscientious about interacting with the primary care doctor i really like when i do have the chance to to actually call the patient's physician because they will tell they can tell you something like oh yeah we tried that medication before it didn't really work or you know this is the background history for that patient so i find it very helpful but generally speaking uh the hospitalist model is probably what you know we transitioned to because uh you can do seven days in a row so you know you can be in the hospital for the length of your stay and hopefully, you know, you would see the same physician, whereas you're not having to go back and forth between the hospital and clinic. Yeah, that's interesting. Judy's asking, what's the difference between integrative medicine and lifestyle medicine? Now, that's a great question. And I looked into that myself because I was trying to decide what I wanted to get into. And so I compared functional medicine, integrative medicine and lifestyle medicine. And so lifestyle medicine, it's kind of what I just mentioned. It, um, it's kind of, they're all add on subspecialty, so to speak. A physician has to get board certified in another field first. So surgery, uh, pediatrics, family medicine, internal medicine. And these additional subspecialties are additional training that people do. So integrative medicine, I think of it more as a concept where it, integrates different modalities into the treatment plan. So they would bring in acupuncture or um, meditation 
Um, what else do they do? Uh, integrative medicine. I think those are the main things that I'm thinking of right now, but they also do cover the same principles of lifestyle medicine. They do talk about diet, they talk about sleep, they talk about exercise. So um, they're very similar, but I would say integrative medicine more is integrating different modalities into it. Lifestyle medicine doesn't seem to really talk about um, acupuncture and herbal medicine and different areas as much. And functional medicine is similar as well. Um, but I would say the difference with functional medicine is that they focus on getting to the root of the problem. And so when you do their training, and I've done part of their training as well, um, they really focus on the cellular level. Um, so uh, biochemistry, the testing, and focusing on why um, the individual patient has those particular symptoms. So if you've been having abdominal pain for a long time, and you've been going to several physicians and they cannot figure out what you have, a functional medicine probably would be um, the next place to go. Great, thank you for explaining that. Charlene says, what do you eat in a day, especially working in a hospital where the food isn't always the healthiest? That's an understatement. <laughs> yes, I know. I know PCRM is working to get hospital food uh, improved and healthier, um, but I always bring my lunch. On um, the few days when I don't, I regret it because I can never really find anything um, in the cafeteria. But usually, so for breakfast, I do um, oatmeal uh, or cereal. I use macadamia nut milk. I like that um, the best, better than almond milk, I think. And sometimes I do English muffins. Whole Foods sells these English muffins that are vegan. So I would do that sometimes with peanut butter and honey. Um, yeah, I do hate honey sometimes. Um, or I would um, use it with, what is it? This, this tempeh. Have you ever had the light life tempeh? I'm allergic to soy, so no, oh, but they actually make a, they make things now out of like other things that other than soy. Yeah, yeah, they do. They have some veggie links that are like pea protein based. Um, so sometimes I do that, but not often, but usually it's cereal or like a piece of bread with peanut butter for breakfast. And then lunch, I, I make tofu um, and I do beans. And so I would do that with like rice or potatoes. I love baking sweet potatoes, um, because those are so nutritious. And then I do vegetables, like I love vegetables. I roast and cook every kind of vegetable, Brussels sprouts, uh, broccoli, carrots, cauliflower, um, yeah, asparagus. And then usually kind of the, uh, the same thing for dinner, but maybe a salad with chickpeas, like a big salad. When I have a salad, I'm talking about like a big bowl, probably like, three or four cups of stuff. <laughs> do you, I'm, I'm guessing it's different when you're a hospitalist, you're not necessarily with other doctors, but do you, do they ever see your lunch or ask you any questions? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, you're right. We don't eat lunch with um, others. You know, you just basically eat them and you can, but um, some of them have found my website and they've like, they ask me about it and say, Oh, you do plant-based nutrition. Tell me more about that. Um, one of my coworkers is um, vegan. I discovered that recently. Yeah, so people, um, some of the nurses on my job have asked me because a few of them are trying to go plant-based. Uh, so we do talk about that. So that's pretty cool. And when I bring uh, snacks or things for the team to eat, it's, you know, I always bring them plant-based foods because I want them to try something different because the norm is the usual stuff that people who are not plant-based would eat. So I try and introduce people to things that they may not otherwise try, that they may think doesn't taste good, but actually does taste good. Since as a hospitalist, Dr. Judy, you probably won't see the patient again. Do you have an opportunity to, to teach them a little bit about what you know? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you should ask that because what I find about being a hospitalist is that people are more motivated to change their diet because they have an acute event. So sometimes they bring up the topic, you know, I have patients who are in with a stroke or a heart attack and they say, you know, I'm going to stop eating fried foods. And, you know, that just opens the door for us to have a conversation um, about their diet. And, you know, sometimes I would, you know, 
talk to them more about it or give them my website or something like that if they seem like they're interested. But I've actually been surprised to find that hospitalists actually seems to be um, more opportunities for at least, what do you, what do you wanna say, setting the groundwork for someone to develop a plant-based diet later. Or planting seeds, yeah, planting seeds of change. I think that's plantrician projects quote. But um, yeah, that's kind of how I see it because people don't make change overnight typically. Um, so you know, every little person that they meet that is saying to them about their diet, hopefully at some point it may have an impact. So I think of it like that. Oh, that's great. Why do you think the food is so unhealthy at a hospital? And it's not just the food in the cafeteria, it's what they serve the patients. I know. It's, we talk about this and we say, you know, it's like the patient has a heart attack or a stroke or they're in the hospital with, you know, this condition and the food that they're fed possibly contributed to them, you know, becoming overweight or having heart disease. So, I think it's just our culture, actually. You know, I think we're wired actually to enjoy foods that are salty, fatty, and um, sugary. (laughs) Yeah, what's the third one? Yeah, sugary. So they're really just meeting demand, kind of. You know, it's like people crave these foods, so they spend money for it. And so because most things, a lot of things are driven by profit and money. I think, this is my opinion, I think that that's what drives the food chain and the food supply. But if we decide that, oh, wait a minute, what I eat can impact my health, I can change my diet to potentially not get high blood pressure, which I don't think a lot of people know this. You know, we think that, oh, my grandmother, my mother had diabetes, everybody had diabetes. So when I got older, I'm going to get diabetes. You know, we say these things to ourselves, these negative thoughts. I think they're negative thoughts. And I think, you know, we have to be more careful about the words that we speak um, and speak life instead of speaking, you know, death and sickness, so to speak. So, yeah, that's that's why I think the food is so unhealthy. I think it's really just a demand. Um, If you go to different countries, it's, it's a little bit different. Even if you go to a McDonald's, um, I've been to Paris before, but that was a long time ago. But I can remember one difference between the McDonald's in Paris, which is a chain restaurant that's here. The servings were smaller, a lot smaller, maybe half. You know, supersizing things wasn't something that they valued in that um, in that culture. And they also had some different menu options too. They had some things that were maybe a little bit healthier. Um, so I do find that interesting. That is, that is really, really interesting. Uh, Bulen says, what are your thoughts on the quality of tap water in general, pharmaceuticals, fluoridation, other chemicals? That's a great question. I know that there's been a lot of concern lately about water and alkaline water seems to be becoming really popular. But first of all, I think any water is better than no water, right? So if tap water is all someone has access to, then by all means drink them. It's not gonna kill you or cause you to have, you know, some chronic disease or anything like that. Water is definitely better than drinking juices, um, things with sugar in them. Um, and I don't know of any particularly robust study that has actually compared, you know, tap water to bottled water or anything like that. So I would just say go with what you prefer taste-wise and what fits with your budget. Me personally, I don't drink tap water. (laughs) I don't like the way it tastes. So I buy bottled water, but I think a filter works just as well, you know? Um, It also depends on what country you live in and where your water supply comes from. So for example, I'm originally from Bermuda. And so the water that we drink, that we drink there, comes from the rainwater. They don't have big factories and air pollution and different things like that. So the roofs are white. The roof of the house is white. So the, the water um, runs down to the roof and there's like a pipe on the side of the house that runs under the house where the tank is. So you have to get your tank clean like every so often, you know, to keep it sanitary and things like that. But basically it's just rainwater that you're drinking. So people in Bermuda drink the tap water, you know, because they live in a different environment. There's different things in the air and the water system. 
So I think that if you live in somewhere where you may not have, you know, as pure air and as pure water system, you may want to think about whether you want to drink tap water or not. But again, I don't think it's something that you need to break the bank for, you know, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Do you drink tap water? Well, I we do uh, we we have a water water filter system i don't i don't i just mm -hmm. i've just never trusted it because i you know i hear about how people like flush their pharmaceuticals down the toilet and it ends up in our tap water and i just don't want to take somebody else's drugs so we, we mm -hmm. it is it does start with tap water but we have we actually have two we have the berkey and we have the aqua true oh that sounds nice i've not heard of those ones yeah i i've heard of the berkey from crispy cancer and somebody actually gift that they were both gifts actually so we have one in one room and one in the other room yeah oh, awesome yeah i i take my gallon container to whole foods and refill it you know they have the refill that's what i do nice so we have a question from julie about your beautiful hair i would like to know what dr brangman uses in her natural hair oh wow <laughs> i actually have a confession this is braids actually <laughs> so this is not actually my hair um, but i can tell you what i do use in my hair um i actually use a product from my stylist it's salon um, influence that's the brand i get it from my hair salon influence um so you can't really get it in the stores or online and um I'm trying to think of something else in the grocery store. But yeah, I, I like, I use professional products on my hair. I just find it works better. Drinking lots of water is helpful. And then using oil, oil on my scalp, oil on my hair um, is also good too. Just like a mix of different oils, like coconut oil, especially um, with a little bit of maybe peppermint or tea tree sometimes is good. But oil on your hair, not in your mouth. Right. Yes, exactly. Oil on my scalp. That's what I use it for. Right. So Tiffany says there are perhaps some physicians that aren't open to having plant-based nutrition conversations with their patients. What advice would you give to encourage this to happen? Mm. Okay, that is a really good question. So this is how it basically works, right? And I'm a pretty much straightforward person, so I'm just going to tell you like it is. So like I say, I mentioned earlier, you know, as physicians, we're drilled that everything needs to be evidence based. It needs to be a study for it or research thing like that. Okay, you may not be able to go and pull a study and give it to your physician because truth is they may not read it in that moment, right? But I will tell you the biggest um, eye opener for a physician who's resistant is you making that change yourself. And when you go back to your doctor, they're going to be so blown away by whatever improvements you have made. Let's say it's blood pressure or your diabetes or your weight. You know, they're going to be so surprised at how you did it that they're going to ask you, oh, what did you do? And that will open the door for them to actually want to look into it some more. Uh, I have a colleague that um, is has a lifestyle medicine practice and she sees uh, patients and what convinces their physician to actually embrace the plant-based diet a little bit more is when that patient makes a dietary change and then goes back to the doctor so that's what i would say now if you're someone who's plant-based you have no medical problems you're healthy and everything like that i would say if your doctor is open to it maybe pulling a putting a research article about it um and a place that you can find resources would probably be either the American College of Lifestyle Medicine website, or um, there's a study about plant-based diets by Satija. That's one of the authors, S-A-T-I-J-A. -A. And it's entitled, I think it's healthful plant-based diets versus unhealthful plant-based diets. But she also has a few studies about plant-based diets that I think are really good. Um, articles that someone could share with their physician but that's a really good question i get that a lot people often message me and ask am i doing primary care um and i find, i feel that i can have more impact by doing what i'm doing now by being a hospitalist and then having my um i call it a side business at the moment but i do um, my, com my company is new well health and i do speaking engagements um social media and soon going to be doing either like a, a program, kind of like the summit, you know, how it was like a webinar, virtual thing, doing different things like that events is really what I really love because I can reach large amounts, large groups of people 
uh, at the same time and, you know, make it fun. Um, so, yeah. So as a hospitalist, it sounds like people have to be in the hospital to see you. Is there a way for people to work with you virtually or other ways so that they don't have to be in the hospital to see you? Yeah, that's a good question. Right now, I'm not seeing clients one on one individually, um, but I do have a website, theplantbasedmd.com, and I think you're going to link it in the, the notes. Um, but if you go there, you can, if you subscribe to my email list, you'll get my uh, plant based wellness guide. And I'm going to be start sending, I'm going to be starting to send regular emails um, to my email list. And um, Sort of brainstorming what I'm going to do as a follow up to the summit um, this year. Uh, it's going to be something a little bit different, but kind of similar. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. A virtual uh, webinar option. And hopefully, you know, once, you know, people are comfortable traveling, um, maybe next year or the future years, I can do a health retreat. That's really what I want to do. Um, because event planning is something that I actually do love. It's like a hobby maybe yeah i think it's a hobby <laughs> nice uh, she also wanted to know what made you decide to go into medicine oh what made me think of, what made me decide to go into medicine i'm trying to remember when did i first decide that i wanted to do medicine so my mother was a nurse so i always have had that um influence and awareness about the medical profession my family my parents were both very health conscious um and so we've always kind of had that, you know, health focus that, you know, health is important. And it wasn't really until college, actually, that I kind of really started to think about medicine a little bit more. And to be honest, I really feel that that's what God wanted me to do. I really feel that God spoke to me and like inspired me one day to pursue medicine because um, he said I would have more opportunities if I did medicine as opposed to another degree and that actually has proven to be true so many doors have opened for me um and so really it was an act of obedience initially to what i found god leading me to do um be becoming plant-based also was an act of obedience too because i did i didn't mention this earlier but i did feel that that's what god wanted me to do so that's really the um answer to actually why I decided to pursue medicine. I was kind of resistant at first, but it's my calling. I don't see myself doing anything else. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to um, reach people in a time of uh, vulnerability and need. I think when you're sick in the hospital, you're vulnerable, you know, you're just not in a good place. You know, it's very stressful. And so being able to, you know, be a calming presence and meet them there and also give them hope too, I think is really good. And so that's why I love social media. I love platforms like this, what you're doing, um, the live streams, because nowadays, truthfully, you don't necessarily need to go to a plant-based doctor per se. You can learn so much from people like myself that are online virtually putting out information that are doing webinars and different things like that. So I don't know, but maybe one day I might see patients one-on-one, -on -one, but not right now. God, you see, you seem very calm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Most of the time I am. Um, the pandemic actually really struck me by surprise last year. I was stressed, but most of the time I'm not stressed. And then maybe the Island mentality, you know, Island life is very laid back. So, that's probably what that is. That's great. Well, that's a good quality in a doctor for sure. Uh, let's see, Lori says, can a plant-based nutrition plan reverse rheumatoid arthritis? Recently been diagnosed and put on methotrexate. My goal is to get off the medication as soon as possible. Ooh, that is a great question. So I learned recently about autoimmune disease and the role that diet plays in it. Um, a large portion of the food that we eat in America is inflammatory. It contributes to inflammation. And inflammation is an underlying pathophysiology for a lot of conditions, including um, including autoimmune conditions um, as well. So I wouldn't use the term reverse, but in some cases it has been possible to improve your symptoms or possibly excuse me, put it into remission. 
by changing um, your diet. If you want to follow I don't know if I can give a name. Can I share a name of someone? Because I actually know someone who's a rheumatologist. You may know him. Dr. Micah Yu. Yes, I've had him on the show. He had both him yeah. and his wife. Yes. Yeah. So he posts about autoimmune conditions on his Instagram. So um, whoever asked that question, I, I, I don't know if you're on Instagram or not, but he's on Facebook and Instagram. So he posts a lot about autoimmune conditions. So I would definitely check him out. But yes, it's possible to improve uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus. I know people that have done that specifically, physicians. Um, and so that's that's just phenomenal to me. Because again, like I say, I mentioned earlier how I thought that diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease were irreversible conditions that once you got them, that was it. It would progress and there was nothing you could do. But, you know, lately um, I've been learning that even kidney disease can be improved to some degree with a plant-based diet. And autoimmune diseases can be improved. So to me, I think that's just phenomenal that, you know, something so simple as what we eat can impact our health, but it also impacts our children's health. Um, because, you know, those habits that you instill in your children um, when they're early on will carry on to when they're older. Just like my parents instilled healthy habits in us. Linda says, how much time do you have to talk to your patients about plant-based diets? So primary care, when I, I did primary care um, and the visits were only 15 minutes. So it's funny because I, I've been out of residency for about seven, eight years now, right? And I've been doing hospital work for most of that time, but I did switch for like about a year and a half to do primary care because I thought that I would be able to talk more with patients about uh, lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition. And what I found quickly was that the visits were too short. They were only 15 minutes. And it was so hard to stay on schedule because different things come up in the visit. Uh, you need to check this test. You know, the patient has um, more problems to discuss than you originally anticipated. So I just felt it was, it was not enough time. So that's how, long, that's how long you have in primary care. But hospitalist is a little bit different. You maybe have, depending on where you work, 14 to 20 patients that you see in a day. Usually my, my hospital, my company, our hospitalists see about 14 to 18 a day. Um, so you do have the chance to go back and see that patient again. And you typically see them every day for, you know, a few days of that hospital stay. So they do get to know you. So it's hard for me to count exactly how many minutes but I know each time I'm in the room, I'm spending 10 minutes. So I may see a patient twice in a day. So that's 20 minutes. And if I'm seeing them every day, um, it still to me seems like more time than I had in the clinic. Because yeah. I'm not as, you know, you're not as on a schedule so much. You know, you have this number of patients to see and you sometimes do see them again that day. So. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and it probably is a doctor. You can't go in there with like a go vegan t-shirt on. Yeah, no, I wouldn't do that. Um, again, because, you know, with motivational interview, the patient has to be motivated and ready. So you kind of have to test the waters before you really bring it up kind of and see how open they are. And if they're not open or not receptive, then I don't, I don't um, say anything more about it. Right. That's probably why I couldn't be a doctor. <laughs> um, Maggie says, how can I convince my husband that plant-based is better and healthier than his Mediterranean diet? Oh, so Mediterranean diet does have a lot of health benefits, to be honest. Like the data comparing that to the American diet actually do look favorable. Now, you, now he's done some good by going Mediterranean, so you want him to take the next step. So um, what I would say is, it's kind of hard for me to say without knowing him, like you have to tap into someone's motivation for doing things, you know, like some people have a motivation to change their diet because maybe they have joint pain and they're like 50 or 60 and they want to um, be able to run around with their grandkids. Uh, or maybe they get shoulder breath a little bit when they walk and they want to be able to travel. So I would try and tap into what motivates him. Like, is there a reason that he might have that he may decide to change his diet like 
maybe longevity, maybe living longer, maybe being able to live healthier. I don't know if weight loss, um, but you have to tap into the why. You know, I think the why is really the key to getting anyone to make any um, change. Um, and if, if you don't mind, if I just share um, my why, as I'm talking about, you know, the why being important, um, why I choose to live healthy and, you know, try and give my, my body the best environment <laughs> um, so that it can flourish is because I really do believe that when we function um, in optimum health, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, it enables us to do whatever it is we were intended to do on this earth. Um, so, you know, I'm a spiritual person. And so I think that everyone, every individual has some purpose in life, something they're supposed to do to make an impact for the greater good of society. But I feel that if you're sick and debilitated and spending um, weeks of the year at the hospital, you know, I have some patients that every other week they're in the hospital, uh, for something. So if you're in another hospital or if you're sick, you're just going to be less likely to do whatever it is that you're supposed to do. So that's my 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 why. Marcin says, what hospital do you work at? I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I work for um, Wake Med. I also work for a few other hospitals um, doing some local, but my main hospital is Wake Med. Nice. A tiny says, is there any evidence that plant-based diets help pancreatitis? My husband just had his first attack and was given very little information when released from the hospital. Go figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you see pancreatitis a lot, oftentimes pancreatitis is flared up by, well, there's several different um, triggers for pancreatitis flare-ups, but I have not come across anything for pancreatitis and plant-based diets, actually. I have to be honest, that's something that I am gonna look up after this. All of the conference, conferences and reading that I've done and articles, I've never seen any mention um, about plant-based diets and pancreatitis because there are other um, triggers that are pretty well established for what causes pancreatitis. Well, like you usually eat something like alcohol, gallstones, um, there's idiopathic, like autoimmune. Um, those are the main, main triggers. I know I had it, my last dog had it and he'd always get it because he, mm -hmm. he'd eat crap at the park. You know, he just, don't, you know, and he'd scavenge mm -hmm. it and he'd always have a flare. So I'm guessing maybe they're not eating the healthiest food. Yeah, probably not, probably not. Yeah. So uh, Stephen says it would be helpful if dietitians and hospitals were more knowledgeable of whole food, plant based, no oil diets. It's amazing that the sad standard American diet is the main driver of disease. Yet, according to what the health documentary, major organizations have taken donations from big meat and then they proceed to endorse the Dash and Mediterranean diets, most which have meat and added oil. According to Dr. Esselstyn, only the whole food, plant based, no oil diet has been clinically shown to reverse diseases such as heart disease. So, how do we give the establishment a kick in the pants to start recommending healthy nutrition? I think that's um, something that PCRM is doing a really good job at trying to get the establishment, the mainstream organizations to acknowledge plant-based diets. They've sued several um, organizations before. Um, but I don't know. I think that's a million dollar question, right? Like, why is it that we have such a focus on pharmaceuticals as opposed to really preventing disease? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's a cultural thing, but I think it's I think a lot is money driven. Yep, I agree. Cheryl says, do you have advice for someone with the autoimmune disease vitiligo? Can a plant based diet help this condition? Vitiligo is autoimmune, um, so I would think that it possibly could be, although I have not had any patients specifically that have been able to improve it with a plant-based diet. Um, but um, plant-based diets are so helpful for so many other conditions, you know. Um, dietary changes do make a difference in thyroid, um, autoimmune uh, hypothyroidism conditions. Um, so... I cannot say for sure about vitiligo. Great. Uh, Mandy says, how many friends and family members have you influenced? 
you know, go plant-based. So what I like to do is I like to have events at my house. I haven't had any since COVID, unfortunately, but I like to have events at my house where I have friends over. Um, most of them are not plant-based, maybe half are. Yeah, half are. And I have all vegan food. And what I really love is having food that's really delicious, that's vegan, and everyone being so surprised that it's vegan. And they usually ask me, where did I get this? Where did I get that? Uh, where did I, they ask me, where did I buy, you know, this, or how did, how did I make this particular food item? Um, so that's how I kind of influence my friend circles with um, plant-based diet by introducing it to them, you know, bringing them over and feeding them. People like to eat. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, they may not, they may not go to the store or the restaurant and buy it but if you can give it to them for free there's really no harm in them trying it <laughs> that's what i always used to do is i would say hey uh, you know like at the time of in a restaurant in years it's not just because of the pandemic i like my food better at home but when i would be in a mixed group i'd say if you eat vegan i'll pay for your meal and guess what he ate vegan yeah and also you probably find this too i just feel that even your presence can make people think about what they order. Cause I, I don't say anything when I'm out eating with friends, but when I'm there, they may be, they're more likely to try a plant-based option it seems. And I just like, you know, usually, I just used to say, you know, you can order whatever you want. You know, I'm not, you know, saying anything, but I don't know, just my presence, they seem to think, oh, she's ordering that. Let me try the veggie burger or let me, you know, get a salad. So uh, influence, we all have influence. <laughs> People always apologize to me when they're eating because they, they think of me as like this pristine, perfect eater. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm eating some salt. I'm eating some, I don't care. Just if as long as you're eating vegan, I am very happy. Yeah. People do sometimes feel guilty about what they're eating. I try and kind of alleviate that. You know, it's, guilt is not something you need to be feeling. <laughs> uh, Tiff, uh, no, it, who's saying this about intermittent fasting? Uh, yes. Tiffany, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Oh, intermittent fasting, I am a fan of. There is evidence and research behind um, intermittent fasting with regards to uh, weight loss. It's helpful for that. Um, and I at least um, would recommend 12 hours, 12 hours fasting. So your last meal, maybe 7 p.m., you don't eat before 7 a.m. That's like the easiest one. But if you can do longer, 14 or 16 hours is really good too. Um, it's also helpful for insulin resistance, diabetes. Um, yeah, I'm learning a lot about that in the courses that I've been taking lately. So it's fascinating. Yeah, that's neat. Do you, are we going to look forward to another version of the Reclaim Your Health Summit this year or perhaps be able to listen to it again? Because it was very good. Thank you. Thank you. I had so much fun doing it and I got so much good, so much feedback. All the feedback was good. Um, and it was really, really fun to put together. Yeah, so um, working now on what we are going to put out for September um, that can meet some of the needs that I've seen people have, you know, when they message me, um, there seems to be a common common theme of what people kind of need help with, either transitioning to plant-based diet or weight loss. I get a lot of messages about that. So we are working on creating something, a virtual, um, virtual event. Um, and it's going to be fun because, you know, I like to have fun and I like to be creative. So it's going to be different and unique, but it's not going to be the same thing. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not, maybe it's just me, but I, I'm not the type of person to do the same thing the same way each time, you know, it's going to be different, but it's going to be impactful. Well, I can't wait to find out what it is. And if, if, if you want, we could help promote it on this show. I don't have the link or website up on it yet. Um, but it's going to be about transitioning to plant-based diet and probably weight loss uh, for women. Nice. Nice. I saw a question here. Uh, uh, Lori, I'm trying so hard to be plant-based, but keep stumbling, but I'm not giving up. Would you please give some tips to accomplish this lifestyle? Oh, I feel like that's kind of what I specialize in, helping people to transition because so many people reach out to me and having a hard time. So firstly, I would say congratulations, you know, for even being motivated enough to say, hey, I need to change my diet. So kudos to you for that. Um, but then also I would say, um, make sure you're giving yourself grace and so don't be too hard on yourself. And based on where you are, 
I would either set a goal for a specific dietary change that you want to make in that week, if that makes sense. So let's say if your thing is you're getting hung up on pizza, let's say you love pizza and you're getting pizza twice a week now. So rather than me saying, okay, don't eat pizza at all, I would say, okay, let's try vegan pizza. Um, put vegan cheese on it and have a vegan pizza or decrease the number of days per week that you're eating pizza. So let's say if you're eating it twice a week, say I'm going to eat it once a week, once every other week, but it's your choice. Um, these are kind of like smart goals, what we actually counsel patients through with, but writing it down um, and setting a goal, something that's specific, something that's measurable, is going to be able to help you to make that change and think of it as baby steps. You know, it can be overwhelming to say, okay, I need to go vegan. That sounds like going from zero to a hundred overnight, but just break it down into bite size steps that you can handle. And I can't tell you or someone else, you know, what you need to do or how you need to do it. Cause everyone is an individual and everyone has different families, you know, so you have to kind of sit down and decide, you know, what you want to do. But I think setting a specific, a specific goal, like the pizza, like one thing and doing it that way may be easier than just saying, okay, I'm going to go plant-based. Like, how do I do it? Right. And here's a fun question. Do you have a favorite treat or dessert that you like or a favorite meal? Um, favorite treat or dessert? <laughs> I like, I like fruit. So I, I prefer fruit for dessert and I like mangoes a lot. I love mangoes, mango, everything, mango, dried mangoes, fresh mangoes, mango juice. <laughs> I wish that they grew in North Carolina. And I used to always wish that they grew in Bermuda when I was um, younger and living there. But yeah, fruit is my go-to. And um, I actually, I don't know if I'm supposed to say, well, you know, people don't share that age, but it doesn't bother me. Anyway, I'm 40, right? So I go 41 this year. And so um, don't have any health problems. I'm grateful, you know, that I've been able to uh, maintain health and, you know, I travel and basic different things like that. So I don't have any issue with eating fruit and I love fruit. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? I know there's different kinds of mangoes. There are those, uh, Alf is it called Alphonse, the smaller ones? And then there's the yeah. one we traditionally ones. The Haitian ones are the best. Alfonso ones are really good too. But yeah, I go to the ethnic grocery stores, like the Indian or Mexican grocery stores, and you can buy those mangoes. Put them in a put them in a brown paper bag. Helps them to get nice and ripe. Yeah. I, I think Tiffany is your biggest fan because she has so many questions for you. I don't know if you know her, but she wanted to know what do you do for fun. Oh, what do I do for fun? That's an interesting question. I like to travel. Actually, I like outdoor activities. Like um, actually like bike riding, uh, anything that's outdoors and adventurous, you know, jet ski, zip lining, I like all that stuff. Yeah, bike riding, running, walking. I like outdoor adventure. I'm the type of person that I would say to my friends, hey, let's do this. And they may be kind of hesitant, like, uh, I don't know if I want to do that, but I would, I would want to do it. That's great. Well, I think it's amazing what you're doing and I really appreciate it. Oh, okay, I was gonna say goodbye, but then this always happens. I always try to say goodbye and then they sneak in a question. Here you go, Dina. Do you eat flax for omega-3 or do you rely on greens for that? And do you take a DHA EPA supplement? Yeah, I definitely take flax and I use it in my smoothies. I try and shake it on food randomly, whether it be cereal or a salad, you know, just a teaspoon of it because it does have your omega-3s. Um, generally, I think um, taking a DHA supplement, DHA and EPA omega-3 supplement is a re very good idea because the vegan diet potentially could be low in those two particular essential, um, sorry, those two omega-3s. So I do have a uh, a vitamin. It's like a spray that has omega three in it. Great. Well, how can we support you or follow you? I put all the links in the show notes. I put your Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and Twitter. So, is there a particular place you spend most of your time other than the hospital? I 
<laughs> yeah, I am mostly on Instagram. Um, I have been taking a slight break over the past couple of months um, just to kind of like reset and, you know, figure out how I'm going to come back for 2021. But um, yeah, so Instagram is my main platform, the plant-based MD. I'm on Facebook as well. Oh, how could I forget to mention? So because it's Lifestyle Medicine this week, I am going to be joining um, a couple of other physician friends of mine. We're going to do a Facebook Live on my Facebook page. So go to my Facebook page and follow and like. Uh, we're going to be doing one on Tuesday, this Tuesday, with pediatricians, plant-based lifestyle medicine pediatricians. And on the next day, Wednesday, June 2nd, we're going to do one with uh, internal medicine doctors. So I've called it um, how to thrive and live well. Oh yeah, setting your children up to thrive and live well. And then the second day is going to be setting yourself up to thrive and live well. And that's going to be at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So that'll be 5 p.m. my time, Pacific time. That's great. I'll, I'll make sure I like you on Facebook. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much, yes. Dr. Raymond. It's such a pleasure getting to know you a little bit better. And thank you so much for all the work that you do. Thank you so much. This was so fun. And thank you so much for all the work that you do as well. You're a huge inspiration to me. And I'm so glad that we got to connect. I cannot wait till we have conferences in person. Hopefully we can meet in person one day at one of these uh, plant-based conferences. <laughs> Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time when my guests are Nina and Randa Nelson. They wrote a book called The Clear Skin Diet, and they are going to be doing a cooking demo. Take care, Dr. Bringman. Bye-bye.